All right, so let's do uh, 6.1. So 6.1 is about, uh, well, chapter 6 is all about functions, right? That we're going to be talking about functions in a great deal of detail. Um, so so 6.1 is, is um, just a reminder of what functions are. And, um, and then we're going to talk about uh, certain concepts like domain and range, okay? So first of all, a relation is a rule that maps the elements from one set, called the domain, to elements of another set, called the range. A relation that maps each element of the domain to exactly one element of the codomain is called a function. Okay, so, uh, so for example, let's say that you have a domain that's made up of the numbers uh, 1, 2, and 3. And then you have a range that's made up of the numbers, uh, oh, let's see, 2 and 4, or something like that. If you have some kind of relation that maps 1 to 2, maps 2 to 4, and maps 3 to 4, this is a function. Because each element in your domain is being mapped to only one element in the range, right? So 1 is getting mapped to 2 and only to 2. 2 is getting mapped to 4 and only to 4. 3 is getting mapped to 4 and only to 4, right? So this is a function. Here's a relation that would not be a function. If you had something like 1, 2, 3, uh, 2, and 4, and you had 1 getting mapped to 2, 2 getting mapped to 2, uh, and then 3 getting mapped to 2, and 3 getting mapped to 4. This is not a function, right? It's not a function because 3 gets mapped to two different values, right? So 3, three is getting mapped to two different values, right? It's getting mapped to both 2 and 4, so this is not a function. Okay? Um, so that's the one and only rule, right? A relation is just a rule that takes elements from one set called the domain and maps them to elements in another set called the range. A function is a specific kind of relation, right? It's a relation where each element in the domain gets mapped to only one element of the range. So you don't have any elements of the domain getting mapped to two different places. Now, visually, we can determine uh, if a relation is a, a function by looking at the graph of the function. Um, the graph has to pass the vertical line test. So the graph of a function in x right, has to pass the vertical line test. Um, in other words, assuming the domain is represented on the x-axis, you shouldn't be able to touch more than one point on the graph with any vertical line. The reason for this is that if there are two points right on top of each other, so that you know a vertical line would cross through both of, both of those points, then that means the domain element there got mapped to more than one place, which means it's not a function. For example, y equals x cubed passes the vertical line test, but x squared plus y squared equals 4 does not. Right? So y equals x cubed is a function, x squared plus y squared equals 4 is not. Right? And here's a picture. Right? Here's x cubed. Clearly it's going to pass vertical line test. Right? Anywhere you pass a vertical line, it's only, only going to hit one point at a time. Right? So this is uh, y equals x cubed. But if you had x squared plus y squared equals 4, well, that's a, a circle centered at 0, 0 with radius 2, right? Well, so this is, uh, sorry, this is x squared plus y squared equals 4. Clearly, this is going to fail the vertical line test, right? So it's not a function. You have you, your domain element here, I don't know what it is, but whatever this element is, it's getting mapped to two different outputs, right? It's getting mapped to two different outputs, so it's not a function. Okay, um, so that visually speaking, that's how we tell if a relation is a function. Algebraically, a relation is a function in x if you can solve the equation for y and get a single expression in terms of the variable x. For example, um, 6x squared minus 3y equals 12 describes y as a function of x. You can tell because you can solve this thing for y, right? You can get negative 3y equals 12 minus 6x squared, and then you can divide by a negative 3, and you get y equals 
negative 4 plus 2x squared, or if you prefer, you could say y equals 2x squared minus 4. But it's a function, right? It's a function because for each input value of x, you're only going to get one output value for y. On the other hand, <laughs> um, something like this is not a function. We could try to solve this thing for y. Um, I think our best bet, uh, well, actually, actually, this is quadratic in y, so we could use the quadratic formula. Uh, this is a little bit trippy, but but just imagine that x cubed is some number like like two, and imagine that x fourth is is some other number like three, right? And then two already is a number, and so what you basically have is two y squared plus three y. Uh, sorry, 2y squared plus 3y minus 2 equals 0. So you can use quadratic formula to solve for y. You can say y equals negative b, right? b is x to the fourth. It's negative x to the fourth plus or minus the square root uh, b, squ uh, b squared. So x to the fourth squared would be x to the eighth uh, minus 4 times a times c. So 4 times a would be 4x cubed. And 4x cubed times negative 2 would be uh, negative 8x cubed. So it's minus a negative 8x cubed. That's plus 8x cubed all over 2 times a. So divided by 2x cubed. So there you go. That's how you would solve that thing. Uh, pretty nasty. But there you go, right? You can solve it for y. The problem is you get two different two different output values, right, for each input value. So, so you plug in an input for x, you're going to get two outputs for y. Um, I'm suggesting here that we take a look at the graph. So let's do that. Let's see what this thing looks like. It's it's pretty nasty, I'm, I'm sure. Um, let's see. So we have x cubed, uh, x cubed y squared, plus x to the fourth y minus 2 equals 0. My kids are fighting. <laughs> there you go. Oh, so there's that relation. Pretty crazy, right? Pretty nasty. But you can see it's not a function. Fails the vertical line test. Fails it here. Fails it here. Uh, so yeah. Well, this is interesting, though. It's not even, it's, it's completely undefined between, you know, what would this be, like negative uh, 1.75 or something, and negative 1.75 and 0. It's, there's, there's no function value there at all. It's kind of interesting. Um, but, yeah, so that's that relation. Clearly not a function, right? Clearly not a function. I wonder if we plug in, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to plug in our solution because uh, I'm, just, I'm just curious now. But we have our solution was negative x to the fourth. I'm just going to do the positive half plus uh, square root of x to the eighth plus 8x cubed over 2x cubed. Oh, wow, that's interesting. Look. So the positive half gives us this stuff in blue, which you can see does coincide with some of the graph. And, and that blue stuff is a function, right? Because it's only the positive half, so you're only getting one output value instead of two. Uh, if I change this to a negative, I bet that you get the other half. Yep. Very interesting, right? I think it's interesting. There you go. Um, so not a function, right? Definitely not a function. Um, here's another example. So y squared minus x equals 4. This does not describe y as a function of x, but it does describe x as a function of y, which is kind of a trippy thing. I, I don't want you to worry about the, that so much. Uh, what we're interested in here are functions in x. And this definitely doesn't describe uh, y as a function of x because we can solve for y, right? But then we get two output values, right? We take the square root of both sides. We end up with uh, 
y equals plus or minus square root x plus 4. So again, you can see that for each input value of x, you're going to get two output values for y. So this is definitely not a function. We know what this is, though. It's a parabola, right? Uh, if you uh, solve for x, you can say negative x equals negative y squared plus 4, or in other words, x equals y squared minus 4. So this is just a parabola that opens right, and that's been shifted uh, well, what would the vertex be? The vertex would be the point zero, um, or actually, no, we would bring the 4 over, wouldn't we? We would say x plus 4 equals y squared. So really, we would say the, the vertex is negative 4, 0. All right, so there's what that thing looks like, more or less. So clearly not a function, right? Not a function. Fails the vertical line test. I should do a, a better job at actually drawing a vertical line, but... <laughs> there you go. So not a function, right? <clears throat> okay, so here's another set of examples. It says, uh, determine both algebraically and visually where possible if the following relations describe y as a function of x. Okay, let me walk you through um, maybe a couple y x plus y equals 1. Um, I can factor out a y and then divide by x plus 1. That's a function. For sure. Um, for, for one thing, we know it's a function because for each input value of x, you're only going to get one output value for y. You don't have like a plus or minus or anything like that happening. That's definitely a function. For another thing, I have the picture in mind, right? This is 1 over x, but it's been shifted left one unit. So it looks, you know, something like this. Whoops. Not like that. It looks something like this. And then like this. But it passes the vertical line test for sure. So that's a function. Part B, I'm thinking, is not a function. If I solve this for y... And I get y equals plus or minus square root x squared plus 4. This plus or minus thing means that for each input value, I'm going to get two output values. So this is not a function. Right? So there's the algebraic reason that it's not a function. Uh, geometrically, we know that this thing is a hyperbola, right? It's a hyperbola centered at 0, 0. Uh, and m and n are both 2. 1, 2, 1, 2, 1, 2, 1, 2. So and it opens up and down. So it's this thing, right? <laughs> Which clearly is going to fail the vertical line test, right? So not a function. Definitely not a function. Part C. ln of x plus y minus 3 equals y. If we want to solve this thing for y, we better get rid of the natural log, so I'm going to move the 3 over. And then exponentiate, right? <clears throat> so I get x plus y equals e to the y plus 3. Well, I still haven't quite solved for y, right? I could solve for x by moving the y over, but, but that, that would just show that... Uh, this is a function uh, in y. It's a function of x in y. But, but we want to show that this is a function in x, right? So we want to say, we want to try to solve for y. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to move everything that has a y in it to the left-hand side and move everything that doesn't have a y in it onto the right-hand side. And here I get stuck. I mean, I, I'm honestly not really even sure where to go from here. I'm not sure where to go. I, I cannot solve this thing uh, for y. So I have a feeling that it's not a function. But to verify that it's not a function, I'm going to look at a graph. And again, this is not something that I know what the graph looks like, but we've got Desmos. Let's use Desmos. <clears throat> so I'm going to do natural log of x plus y minus 3 equals y. Oh, wow, look at this thing. 
What is even going on here? <laughs> You're getting some crazy, crazy things going on where, like, the domain here is really choppy, right? Uh, this is probably because you're looking at natural log of x plus y, and remember, logarithms are not defined whenever their arguments are less than or equal to zero. So if x is so, it, so down here it's like if y is bigger than, if if, well, how would I say this? If if y is a negative number whose absolute value is greater than x, right? Then um, you're going to have domain issues. So sometimes you do and sometimes you don't, and you can see the craziness that's ensuing there. <clears throat> but you can also see that it's not a function, right? It fails the vertical line test pretty miserably. So, uh, so this thing's not a function. Right? Fails the vertical line test, right? C Desmos, right? Okay, what about e to the x plus y equals 3x? Well, if I want to solve for y, I better take a logarithm to get that exponent down. So I'm going to take natural log. Those will cancel. I'll just be left with x plus y equals natural log of 3x. And if I want to finish solving for y, I would get y equals natural log of 3x minus x. Uh, well, so this is a function for sure, right? For each uh, for each input value of x, I'm only going to get one output value for y, so it's a function. I don't really know what this thing looks like, some kind of natural log, but, but you're subtracting x. I'm curious. <clears throat> y equals ln 3x minus x. Okay, so kind of this interesting thing, but it's it's going to pass the vertical line test, right? I mean, this may look like a vertical line over here, but it's not actually a vertical line. Uh, it just gets really close to zero really fast, and it gets closer and closer to zero, but, but you can see it's not a vertical line. The more you zoom in, the more you see it's not vertical. Okay. So that's definitely a function. One thing that I'll point out is that the vertical line test only applies to rectangular equations. If you were dealing with a, uh, if you were dealing with a polar equation like r equals two minus three cosine theta, this thing would be a limasome, right? Uh, a over b is two thirds, which is less than one, so it's going to be a limasome with an inner loop. So it's definitely going to fail the vertical line test. But note that r is definitely a function of theta. Right? R is definite. For, for each value of theta, you're only going to get one output value for R. So this is a function. It's just that um, it, it's a polar function, and so the vertical line test doesn't really apply anymore. What does still apply is that a function is something where you get only one output for each input. Right? That's, and that's why we defined functions the way that we did on page one. Um, OK. I'm defining these words now. I should have defined them earlier, I guess, because I've been using them all this time. But we sometimes call a domain element of a function an input, and then we call a range, uh, an, the element of the range to which an input is mapped is called an output, right? Now, the, the crazy thing about functions is that um, we're allowed to we're allowed to specify the domain to make the domain anything we want it to be. And so technically, it, you, when you take like higher level math courses, every time you write down a function, you specify the domain, right? You specify the domain every time you, you write one down. That's not typically what's going to happen in calculus. In calculus, they're just going to assume that the domain is some subset of the real numbers, which I'm going to describe in a second. But, uh, but, but let me tell you what I'm, what I'm saying. So for example, if f of x equals the square root of x, and we want the outputs to be real numbers, then the, main, the, the domain would have to be just the numbers from 0 to infinity, right? Because if we let the domain be negative, like if we, if we let, you know, negative 2 be a, an element in the domain, well, then you're going to get a non-real output. So if we want the outputs to be real numbers, then the domain must be 0 to infinity. Now, if, on the other hand, we're okay with non-real outputs, then the domain 
uh, then the domain could be all of the real numbers, right? Um, right? If we're okay with getting non-real outputs, the domain could be all reals. In fact, the domain could even be all of the complex numbers, thanks to De Moivre's theorem. We know how to find square roots of non-real numbers, right? Thanks to De Moivre. So, um, so we could even let the domain be all of the complex numbers if we wanted to, right? So when you just say f of x equals square root of x, it's a little bit ambiguous. It's like, what function are you talking about? Are you talking about the function whose domain is 0 to infinity, in which case all of the outputs are real? Or are you talking about the, domain who, uh, the function whose domain is all of the real numbers, in which case you get some real outputs and some non-real outputs? Or are you talking about the function whose domain is all of the complex numbers, which is like a crazy function to even think about, right? So this is why in, in higher level math, every time we write down a function, we specify the domain as well, so that there's no ambiguity about what function we're talking about. But as I said, in calculus, this is typically not how they do it. Typically in calculus, they, they'll just write the function like this, and you're just expected to know which kind of function they're talking about. So, so let's talk about what kind of function they're talking about, okay? So when functions are written down in algebra and calculus, their domains are rarely stated. And this is because it can be a little bit cumbersome to have to write down the domain every single time. So what domain is intended if it's not specified? Right? So we're going to use the following convention to answer that question, and I'm going to call this the standard domain of a function. So the standard domain of a function, as far as calculus is concerned, is if the domain is unspecified, then it's assumed to be the largest subset of the real numbers for which the outputs are all real numbers. Okay, so we're going to call this the standard domain of the function. So going back to our previous example of f of x equals square root of x, this function would be assumed to have domain 0 to infinity because that's the largest subset of the real numbers for which all of the outputs are real numbers. If you take any larger subset of the real numbers, like negative 1 to infinity, then between negative 1 and 0, you're going to get non-real outputs. And so that can't be the standard domain of square root of x, right? Uh, zero to, and if you take a smaller subset, like 2 to infinity, all of the outputs are going to be real, but that's not the largest subset of the real numbers for which all of the outputs are real, right? This, this is the largest subset of the real numbers for which the outputs are real. Okay, so this is the standard domain of f of x equals square root of x. Um, as far as I know, nobody else uses the, the phrase standard domain. I'm just using it uh, to distinguish between uh, what the domain of a function could be and what we intend the uh, domain of the function to be in calculus, right? And so the intended function is what I'm calling the standard domain, right? The standard domain. Now, if we want to use a domain other than the standard domain, we're allowed to do that. We just have to state it explicitly so that we're clear that we're not using the standard domain anymore. We're using uh, a different domain. Okay? We can find the standard domain of all sorts of functions algebraically. Right? So this chart below, not the chart, chart on the next place, it's actually, it's actually right here. Right? But this chart lists some of the common functions and their standard domain restrictions. Okay, so for a polynomial function, there are no res there are no restrictions. The standard domain of a polynomial function is going to be all reals. Same thing for an absolute value function. There's no uh, there's no restriction. The domain is all reals. If you have uh, if you have a, a radical function, right, like n root of x, and n is even, so if you have an even index, then the standard domain is um, just the positive numbers or zero, right? So x has to be greater than or equal to zero. The, the radicand needs to be big, greater than or equal to zero. That's if n is even, okay? Because if, because if x if n is even and x is a negative number, then nth root of x is gonna be non-real, right? So, and remember the standard domain is the largest set of the reals uh, for which the outputs are also real. On the other hand, if n is odd, then there are no restrictions, right? You can plug in negative numbers and get a real number as an output when n is odd. So there are no restrictions. The, the standard domain of a of a like a cube root function, for example, would just be all reals. <clears throat> when it comes to rational functions, we know that the denominator can't be zero, 
right? Because division by zero is undefined. So the standard domain is going to be all reals except for the numbers that make the denominator equal to zero. So, so that's what you would say. You say the denominator can't be zero. For exponential functions, there are no restrictions. Okay, the domain can be any real number. You can plug in negative numbers. You can plug in fractions, right? We talked about all that earlier in the semester. So no restrictions on the domain of exponential functions. But for logarithmic functions, remember that the argument here needs to be a positive number. So it can't be zero and it can't be negative. X has to be strictly greater than zero. So notice that here, X could be zero. For, a, for like a square root function, X can be zero. That's not a problem. Um, but here, X can't even equal zero. It has to be strictly positive. And then you have your trig functions, right? Sine and cosine are defined for every real number, so their domain is all reals. Tangent and tangent, well, tangent, cotangent, secant, and cosecant, though, they all have asymptotes at certain places, right? They're, they're not defined for certain numbers. So for tangent, um, x cannot be pi over 2 or any integer multiple of pi uh, plus pi over 2, right? So, so like, because you have asymptotes at pi over 2, 3 pi over 2, 5 pi over 2, 7 pi over 2, and so forth. Okay. For cotangent, the asymptotes are on the integer multiples of pi themselves. So at 0, pi, 2 pi, 3 pi. Right? And then secant has the same domain as tangent. Cosecant has the same domain as cotangent. One last thing that I'll, that I'll say is that multiple, multiple restrictions could be required. Okay? Um, so if you've got like a a ra if you've got a rational function but the denominator has a radical in it or something like that, well then you have to find all of the restrictions, right? You have to find all of the restrictions that could take place, and the domain is going to be the intersection of the individual uh, of the sort of individual standard domains, I guess you could say. So let me just give you uh, some examples of this. Well, yeah. So here's an example, right? So let's say f of x equals square root of x over x minus 2, right? So then the standard domain restrictions are, first of all, x has to be bigger than or equal to 0. Otherwise, the square root of x is undefined, or is not a real number. But also, x minus 2 can't equal 0, right? Uh, because that would give you a 0 in the denominator, and that's, that's not a real number. So both of these restrictions have to, have to be met, I guess. So we know that x would have to be bigger than or equal to 0, and x can't be 2. And so therefore, the standard domain would be 0 to 2, union 2 to infinity. So, so everything from 0 to infinity except for 2. Right? So another way to write that is with set difference. Right? You could say it's everything from 0 to infinity except for 2. Okay. So let's practice a little bit more. Right? Let's find the standard domain of each of the following functions. For this function, the only restriction is that the radicand needs to be bigger than or equal to zero. So x plus one needs to be bigger than or equal to zero. Notice that I'm not like solving this equation. I'm not graphing the function. I'm just trying to find the domain. So as far as the domain is concerned, this plus two has nothing to do with anything. Okay? We just need for the radicand to be bigger than or equal to zero. So which means we need x to be bigger than or equal to negative one. So the standard domain of this function is negative 1 to infinity. For part b, um, well, this is a cube root function. When your index is odd, there are no domain restrictions. So the standard domain here is just going to be all reals. Right? It doesn't matter if the radicand is negative here. The cube root of a negative number is still a real number. So the standard domain is all reals. Uh, tangent of x minus pi over 3. Okay, so this is a little more challenging, I guess. But what we would say is that our argument here is not allowed to be pi over 2 or any integer multiple of pi plus pi over 2, right? In other words, uh, the argument x minus pi over 3, it cannot equal pi over 2 plus n pi, where n is an integer. Right? It can be any other real number, just not these numbers. <laughs> okay. So solving for x, right? you add pi over 3 over to the other side, 
and you see that x cannot, well, this would be 3 pi over 6, and this would be 2 pi over 6. 3 pi over 6 plus 2 pi over 6 is 5 pi over 6. So you see that x cannot be uh, 5 pi over 6 or any integer multiple of pi beyond that, right? So if I wanted to write down the domain, right, this is what x cannot be. That means that x can be everything else. So the domain is going to be all real numbers except for all numbers of the form 5 pi over 6 plus n pi, where n is an integer. Right? So there's the domain of uh, this particular tangent function. Okay? Um, here are some more. f of x equals 1 over x squared plus 1. So the only thing that can go wrong here is if the denominator is equal to 0. Uh, so we need for x squared plus 1 to not equal 0. That means we need for x squared to not equal negative 1, which means we need for x to not equal plus or minus i. But you know what? Uh, i is not even a real number to begin with, right? So remember the standard domain of a function is the set of, uh, is the largest subset of real numbers for which the function is, is defined. This function only ceases to be defined when x is, is this imaginary unit. So as long as x is a real number, this function is perfectly defined. Another way to say all of this is that the only time you're going to get 0 you're you're not you're never going to get zero in the denominator here if x is a real number, right? So that means that x could be any real number, right? That's the standard domain of this function is all reals. Okay, here's another one. Oh, this one's kind of an interesting one. So two things could go wrong here. First of all. Uh, we need the radicand to be bigger than or equal to 0, right? So we need 40 minus x to be bigger than or equal to 0. So that's the first thing that needs to, needs to happen. The second thing is that the denominator, right? This is a rational expression. We can't have a 0 for our denominator. So we need for square root of 40 minus x minus 5 to not equal 0. Okay, so we're going to solve each of these, right? So, so this first one would say, you know, 40 has to be bigger than or equal to x, or in other words, right, x has to be less than or equal to 40. This one would say square root 40 minus x can't equal 5, which means that 40 minus x can't equal 25, which means that negative x can't equal negative 15, so x can't equal positive 15. All right, so we need for x to be less than or equal to 40, but we also need for x to not be 15. So the domain is going to be any negative number all the way up to positive 40, right? So negative infinity to 40 except for 15. So there's one way to write down the domain. Another way to say the same thing is, is to say, well, it can be anything from negative infinity to 15, and then anything from 15 to 40, including the 40, not including the 15, right? So either of these is fine. You don't have to write both of them down. Um, they're both good answers, right? Um, they're both acceptable ways to write down your answer. Okay. So that's that domain. I'm curious to know what this looks like. Maybe I'll graph it. Let's take a look at it in Desmos, just for the sake of curiosity. So this is going to be uh, 2x over... Uh, square root of 40 minus x 
uh, minus 5. Oh, and I'm zoomed way in here. Let me zoom out. Okay, that's what this thing looks like. Oh, so it's not too... Oh, it is kind of crazy. You do have this little other branch that's doing this weird curvy thing. But, um, yeah, notice, right? Uh, it's not defined if x is greater than 40, right? x has to be strictly less than uh, or equal to 40. But then also at 15, you have this... It looks like you have an asymptote at 15, right? Yeah, so you've got this asymptote at 15, it looks like. Which is kind of interesting. So the function is also undefined at 15. Uh, so there you go. There's that one. Uh, one more. Okay, one more. What can go wrong here? A, a couple things. So first of all, for a logarithmic function, we need for our argument to be strictly greater than 0. So we need for 2x plus 5 to be strictly greater than 0. And then for another thing, we're not allowed to get 0 in the denominator. So we need for x to not equal 0. <laughs> okay? So solving this one, 2x has to be greater than negative 5. So x has to be greater than negative 5 halves. But just not 0. Okay? So the domain would be uh, negative 5 halves to infinity except for 0. Another way to write down the same thing is negative 5 halves to 0 and then 0 to infinity. Okay, Again, e either one of these would be perfectly acceptable answers. Um, so you can, you can write down either one as your answer. But notice that I'm not including the negative 5 halves, right? That's because uh, the argument has to be strictly greater than 0 when you're dealing with a logarithmic function. Okay. Um, so, so we've talked a lot about domain. Okay. Let's talk about the range a little bit. Um, finding the range of a function algebraically is really not a very easy task, generally speaking. Um, so, so we're not really going to get into that a whole lot. But what we will do is think about things graphically a little bit. Graphically, if you, if you can see the graph of a function, then it's easy to tell what the range is. Okay? So just remember, the domain is the set of input values. The range is the set of output values. So graphically, this means that the domain of a function is, is its projection onto the x-axis, and the range of a function is a, its projection onto the y-axis. So I'll show you what I mean by this. Okay. So if I were given this function, even if I didn't know, even if I didn't know what the function uh, was, if I was just looking at the graph of this thing, I can still figure out its domain and range. Okay. So the domain is going to be the projection onto the x-axis. So what I mean by that is, if I were to sort of squish this graph onto the x-axis, right, just collapse it straight down onto the x-axis, what values end up getting covered, right? So this value gets covered, and then every value to the right of it also gets covered. So the domain looks like it's going to be 3 to infinity, including the 3. The range, on the other hand, is the projection onto the y-axis. So that's if I take this graph and I squish it onto the y-axis, right? Which values get covered up? And that would be everything from 2 down. Right? That would be the range. So the range is everything from, from negative infinity up to 2. All right. So that's how we find domain and range when you're given a graph. Let's look at another one of these and then that'll, that'll do it for this section. But let's see if we can find the domain and range of this function. So, again, for the domain, if I imagine squishing this onto the x-axis, uh, I'm going to start here at 0 0.5, and I'm going to end here at 4.5. Okay, so the domain is going to be everything from 0 0.5, not including the 0 0.5, right, open circle, 
uh, up to 4.5, including the 4.5. Right, so I get a bracket there. What about the range? So if I squish this onto the y-axis, then it looks like I'm going to cover everything from 2 down to negative uh, 8.13, right? So all of this stuff is going to get covered up. So the range, it's, it's beginning to look a lot like Christmas. <laughs> no, but the range is going to be uh, everything from negative 8.13 up to 2. Okay, again, not including the negative 8.13, but, but yes, including the 2, right? So there's the domain and range of that function. Um, okay, so that's all I have to say by way of introduction to functions, domains, and ranges. Uh, we'll see you in the next section.